are some things that I would recommend as far as tips are concerned with the culture of the conditioning and, and trying to get the, uh, your athletes, like I spoke of yesterday, to buy into the program, to make it fun, to make it exciting, to make it something that the kids actually enjoy, that they actually take ownership over ultimately, uh, knowing that, like I spoke of yesterday, that it's the key to their success. The level of conditioning that your athlete achieves basically will determine the level of gymnastics that they achieve. Okay? The quality that they do their conditioning in, the quality that they do their basics in, that is going to be the key to how good they get. If your athletes are under-conditioned, your athletes don't condition with the idea in mind that the quality is, is of the utmost importance, you're definitely going to be slowing down their development as far as their gymnastics and their skill acquisition is concerned. With all conditioning, um, at our gym, we try to make it as much fun as possible. People ask me about the TOPS program. The TOPS, TOPS program is wonderful. Um, I think it's something that gyms should look into. I do not think it's for everybody. We at Camp Bay Turners do not do it except for very rare occasions, okay? What we've developed in our gym is what we call the PLUS program. And it is basically a knockoff of the TOPS program, but we don't have to get on an airplane to go climb a rope, okay? And I, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, because some people really use it in their programs, they, they like it, they think that the competitive aspect of it is great, they wanna spend the money to go out to Texas and test and do all those other things, I, I find it very unnecessary, personal opinion. We have used it in the past. I've had kids that make the Pops national team, do all that other stuff. But as a whole, I don't think it's something that is, is necessarily good for the morale of your program. Okay, it's very cutthroat. It's very political, in my opinion, to be honest. Um, and it's something that, again, I think that you can accomplish in your own gym without having to get on the U.S. Airways and use it. Okay. If you have questions specifically about that, we kind of can cover it afterwards because it's kind of a whole different topic. Basically, our PLUS program is something where the kids test. If they accomplish our standards, they get invited into the PLUS program, and then they do it as a supplement to their regular training. Kids that are extremely motivated, um, really enjoy the conditioning aspect of it, don't whine about things, um, are the ones that we would invite into program like that, and it's been very successful for us. The other thing that we used to do prior to the PLUS program, and I recommend to everybody, is some type of, and this would be if you're struggling with getting the conditioning idea across to your athletes and your parents. I guess that would be the best way to preface this. If you're struggling with that, if you have a lot of kids that are complaining about it, parents that are complaining about it, your boss complains about it, because they think you're spending too much time doing that stuff and not enough time doing this stuff. Okay, even though this stuff is the answer to that stuff. Okay, sometimes your boss will hear it from mom that the kids aren't having fun because they're conditioning all the time. Well, you know that's a, that's a fine line that needs to be addressed. It's sometimes a very difficult line that needs to be addressed. And a what we used to call a muscle meat. Sarah, I don't know if you were around for all that muscle meat stuff. It's basically an in-house top testing that turns into a party. Okay, and it's something that you can do on a Saturday in the summer. You, you uh, advertise that you're going to be doing it a couple months in advance. Uh, you get your lower level athletes, meaning levels, I think for us it would be like the current level two through four kids. You, you come up with a little test that you're going to do, sprinting, uh, rope climbs, pull-ups, whatever it may be, whatever you've got in your exercises that you feel are most important for your athletes, and you turn it into a little testing program. They're not necessarily competing against each other, they're competing against the maximum number of repetitions, and you're, you're kind of charting those types of activities. Okay? Afterwards, every child gets a medal or a trophy, regardless of how well they did, and you're trying to get them to understand that conditioning can be fun, that it's that Extremely important for their development. I used the term yesterday that you're handing them things to eat. 
keys to success when you, can, when you condition your athletes properly, but it's an excellent way to make the conditioning fun and interesting. It was amazing as we were gearing up for our muscle meets, how much extra time the kids would spend and how much they would, they would put into getting themselves prepared for that little in-house competition, and it really paid off. Okay? We have since kind of gone away from it because we feel like we don't need it anymore. When we were shifting, maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, from an older conditioning program to the new one that we're using now, we needed to do something to get the kids excited about it, to get them motivated about it, to get them get the parents kind of buying in and, and understanding the, the new philosophy and the things that we were trying to achieve. Okay, before we start also, I'd like to just real, really quickly go over what you're going to see a lot of here, and we spoke about it all day yesterday, and it's, it's the, the type of conditioning that we're doing. First of all, you're going to see things at different levels. You'll see things here for your pre-team or compulsory level athletes, you'll see things for your intermediate or beginning level optional athletes, and you will see things that are extremely difficult here that would get your kids into levels 9, 10, and possibly even level 12. Okay, so things that are, are involved in the TOPS program, and even above and over the top of what the TOPS program requires. Okay, um, you're going to see, hopefully, a level of quality here versus quantity. I always believe in quality over quantity when it comes to the conditioning, especially with kids because the tie-in between how they do their conditioning and how they do their gymnastics is huge. Okay? If you demand quality during their conditioning, in other words, you're requiring good form, you're requiring them to do that correctly, it's going to really tie into the way that they do their basics and the way that they do their gymnastics. Demanding that quality um, is, is huge. Okay? Not just letting them condition, not throwing them a uh, piece of paper up on the wall with a thumbtack and going up to your office for a cup of coffee while they do their conditioning. It's, it's supervising, it's making sure that it's being done properly. With that said, I do think that this is a tough one, but getting the kids to really buy in and take ownership of it for themselves and to, we, we use our seniors, our upperclassmen in our gym to really supervise and look over the little guys. We have a big sister program in our gym, meaning that all of our little guys have what they call their big sister in the program. And the big sister is someone that kind of creates a bond or a family type relationship within your program. It really helps the little guys with their conditioning, the philosophy of the conditioning, helps them through some tough times, you know, gives them encouragement when it comes to competition. It does things of that nature. That is been wonderful for us. Um, our team has never been more cohesive um, since we began that program. I, I would highly recommend that to everybody, creating some type of, of, of things along those lines. Um, but just creating that, again, that culture, that, that family type um, atmosphere within the gym is something that's very, very important. The things you're also going to see is, is level of conditioning, meaning that what we do, you'll see first, and we talked about this all day yesterday, but it's static conditioning first, meaning without movement. I think it's very important that you establish the shapes, that you establish the positions without any movement whatsoever, even if it's basic. Leg lifts are basic, push-ups are basic, pull-ups are basic. But before you do those, you better be really strong in the shapes that you're going to use during those exercises before you add the movement. Once we've established static shaping, we then go into doing things very slowly. Okay? If, if the athletes are able to control and they do them slowly at first, even though gymnastics is a very holistic, very dynamic style sport, if you start with dynamics with your little guys, to me, most of the repetitions are going to be done for them. If you do things in very low numbers, very high quality, and do them slowly at first, I think you're going to get the kids moving in the right direction faster than if you try to kind of force speed and speed to them at, at a very early stage of their development. Okay, so we go, we go static, then slow, then we start building speed, and then ultimately it becomes something that's dynamic or ballistic. Okay, something that's, you know, that, that 
really biometric type condition. It doesn't work with very young children. Like it, it's almost it's almost a bad thing. It kind of almost creates bad habits a lot of times. If you're doing things over and over again in the correct in incorrect positions, you get yourself where you're starting to teach skills, you're starting starting to work on things that are tumbling or they're bars, and you're gonna start to see the shortcomings that they're showing you in their conditioning, rear their ugly face, and their skill acquisition. So I think that it's very important to do those things slowly, methodically, before you add again the power of biometric type exercises. Okay, and then phases, um, periodization is the fancy word we use in gymnastics. I think that whether you use the one I'm about to tell you, or you use a different one, creating some type of plan, I think is very important when it comes to conditioning. I'll go over the philosophy that we use. I'm not gonna go down to the exact dates because I'll bore you to death. But basically, in my mind, there are four phases when it comes to conditioning, and we're gonna kind of go backwards. They finish their season, whether this is a compulsory athlete or a optional gymnast. We'll use an optional gymnast for the sake of this lecture. They finish their season, they're done. They just finished their last season, whether that be regionals or hopefully nationals. We go into what we call a recovery phase. Okay, so their competition is over, their bodies are a little bit beat up, their minds are a little bit worn out, the coaches are a little bit worn out, to be honest with you. Okay, we're all tired. We go into a recovery phase. The recovery phase is basically some, type, some form of maintenance, we, we lessen the conditioning a little bit, we let their bodies heal, we do more fun type activities with our conditioning to get them reinvigorated. We're doing a lot of trying new skills and, and, and really trying to have a little bit of fun again to just kind of re refresh their love of the sport, get them excited again, and, and, and we do that for, for a couple of weeks, three weeks, almost, almost a month. So Nationals end on May 15th. We, we do our recovery from May 15th to maybe where summer training starts, and that would be around June 15th or so. Okay? From June 15th or when our summer training begins, we go into what we call our build-up phase. Okay, the build-up phase is coming off of recovery. Hopefully we're feeling pretty good. We start slowly building up our strength again. Okay? Build-up phase has a lot of plyometric activities in our program. We do leg plyometrics, which I will show you guys a lot of during the next week. Uh, we do boxes and things of that nature, but I try to only do that, that box jumping plyometrics in the summertime. Okay, because number one, it's time consuming. Number one, it takes up a lot of space. And then number three, I would say, is that it's something that has a little risk factor involved. Kids can sprain an ankle, they can break an ankle, we've had that happen, things of that nature, and we don't want that occurring as they're gearing up for their competitive season. So we go away from box jumping stuff as they're gearing up, and we go to more traditional, uh, simplistic exercises to get their legs where they need to be as far as their season is concerned. Okay? So that would be the build up phase. We're getting stronger again. Once they go back to school and we're gearing up to getting them ready for our transition into doing half routines and full routines, which we're trying to get accomplished by the end of October, beginning of November, we call that our mass strength phase. And that's when we are really pushing the envelope. We're trying to get the kids to be bulletproof. Okay, we're trying to get them to be very, very strong, very dynamic, getting them to the point where they're able to fly. Okay? From the max strength phase, once the once the routine phase begins, I guess for lack of a better term, we're starting to do lots of half sets. We're doing full routines. We're doing floor routines. We're following floor routines with extra cardio work to really build it up to make their floor routine not just attainable but to seem easy. Okay, we're trying to do all those other things. We call that our maintenance phase. Okay, and that goes from basically. <coughs> end of October, beginning of November, all the way through their season, when they're going to go, then go into their recovery phase. Okay, it kind of makes sense, and you can you know, gear it towards what, 
your program needs as far as that's concerned. But again, having some type of plan, I think, is very, very important. Okay. That's kind of the, the preface to all this. Now I'm going to kind of go into some of the exercises that we use. Some of these we do virtually every day. Some of them we use only in our max strength phase because they're very difficult and we're really trying to push it. Um, but either way, I think that you know, use some of them, use none of them, but you'll get the idea as far as kind of what we're doing. And then also, you know, I hope what you take away more than anything else because you're going to see a lot of stuff you're doing already. Pull-ups, push-ups, leg lifts, not rocket science. Everybody does them. But what I'd like you to take from this is look at the kids and the way that they're doing it as we're spotting things making sure that they're doing them properly. Again, taking the, the approach of, of quality over quantity is the best thing that we can hopefully leave here today with. And then also is, is the idea, again, the, the culture of, of making conditioning fun. Do not punish your athletes with conditioning. I think that's a huge mistake. Okay? If you punish them, say, hey, that wasn't good, do 20 push-ups. Next time you're going to try to do 20 push-ups in, in, in conjunction with something that you're doing conditioning-wise, they're going to they're going to relate those, those exercises with punishment, and they're not, they're not going to enjoy it. It's trying to get them to enjoy is kind of maybe an over-the-top word, but to to accept the fact that conditioning is probably the most important thing that they do. So we have vault bar, speed floor, and in our gym we also have. And that's, some people call it the fifth event, I call it the first event. The most important thing that they do that prepares them for the rigors of our sport. Okay, trying to really get them to buy into that and really get them to accept that if they want to be good, and I think by nature, when they get on your team, they want to be good. Their, their parents are spending a lot of money. As children, they're spending a lot of their childhood in your facility under your care, so by nature that makes them want to be good, it's almost tricking them into understanding that that's the most important thing that you're providing them. If they want to really be good, which I just defined that they do already, it's, it's getting them to understand that's what's going to make them good. And the quality of their condition will then ultimately take them from good to great. Okay, and those are the things that if you can get them to understand, get them to relish, going to really get your program moving in a different direction. Okay? We're going to go and we're going to begin with core shaping and strength. Again, this is going to go from the extremely simple. Sarah, I think you're in a couple of weeks. All the way up to very difficult. Uh, the first thing is going to be basic uh, static type exercises where we're just trying to get the kids to understand what being tight is. Go to gyms all the time and do camps, clinics, things of that nature. I hear the coaches talking about, hey, tighten up. Uh, hey, hey, you over there, your form isn't very good. And the kids don't have any idea what the coach is talking about. So you have to explain it to them. You have to show them through different types of, of, of discovery drills, I call these, static discovery drills, where you're pushing, pulling, pulling their feet apart, pushing on an arm, pulling on an arm walking by them when they're least expecting it, and you're trying to get them to, to show you that they're not being as tight as possible. But these are obviously very basic things that you can do with the kids, that is simply laying on a, on a stack of panel mats or on the floor, squeezing every freaking muscle in their body. Okay? Getting them to understand what tight means. Finding muscle groups that keep their legs together. What do we have to do to keep our legs together? What do we have to do from with our body to make it so Coach Brad can't walk by and lift my arm up off? What do I have to do? And those are things that can be actually very fun in your in your developmental recreation classes. Okay, tight, little tightness drills, little things like this. Just lay on your belly and squeeze all your muscles. Let's see who can be the tightest. And if I come by, I can't pull your feet apart. You know, just things like that. They're very, very good as far as getting the athletes to understand what tight is. They're laying on their sides, walk by and try to pull their legs apart, try to lift your arm off of her thigh, okay? Squeezing the glutes, keeping, keeping, you see every muscle in that body is tense. Okay, straight body lifts, they love these. They're trying to 
eliminate the world when you lift them up, nothing bends. There's no segmentation in the body at all. It's going to really lend itself to tumbling. Um, it's going to lend itself to vaulting. If you have kids that pike a lot or arch a lot on vault, it's usually because their inner dynamics or their body tension is not where it needs to be. Okay, this is a handstand trainer. This is something I stole from Jeff Wood about 15 years ago. Uh, it's a piece of plywood, as you can see. It's a very thick grade of bungee cord. It's a nylon type bungee cord that you get. It's actually on some mountain climbing, bungee jumping type websites. It's, it's not that surgical tubing stuff that frays and then ultimately breaks. Okay, so it's a little bit more expensive, but I have that piece of plywood with four holes in it. It's, it's kind of pushed through the hole and then I tie a knot on the bottom so it can't come out. And it's looped through a uh, dowel has a hole drilled through it and then down to the other side. Okay, you can kind of see what that's doing. And that is a fantastic drill for body tension, for creating um, locked out handstand positions. And it's, it's placed against the wall or somewhere where we can get to it easily, and the kids do it with trying to lock out those shapes. It's pretty difficult to do, so they spot each other quite a bit as they're getting better at it. Um, but it is an excellent way to create that. And body tension in the handstand shape. <laughs> what we did when we built it, I don't know. What we did when we built it is we had the tallest kid, who was Lindsay Weber at the time, and we figured out how it would be so she could get in. Okay? And she was dying to get in there. So it was probably the bungees are probably six, seven feet long. And then when they stretch, they're obviously they can get a kid of you know, five, six, or five, seven inside. Um, and it ultimately works out because your little guys aren't going to be very strong and good at it at first. So it's okay that the resistance is not that much. And then as they get better at it, all you have to do is simply put a little box in there on it. Those tapes are harder than little guys. At least they get really strong. Okay, you can really see her having to work. It's not easy at all. Okay, and it's, it makes them wiggle it. makes them sway a little bit because it's that difficult. But it tries to get the kids to find those little muscles that they never even knew they had. And they're learning how to establish that stillness, that tightness, and that discipline. Yeah? Your partner helped me pull the bar and I just Yes. It's making it so the bar can't fly back behind them or fly in front of them because, again, there's quite a bit of tension there. At first, I would also always supervise that. And get a little bit hairy if you don't. All right, just some, some overhead, basic static, straight line type drills for a lying handstand. Okay, I think that it's very important for the kids to do handstand shapes on their feet while standing. That's where they can establish their head positions, where they're going to be looking. This is another one where it kind of impedes where her head should be because of, of the mat, obviously chin, can't go any further down than that, but trying to create those handstand positions, not just upside down, okay? A lot of times they get upside down and they really struggle with those shapes because they can't do it lying or standing on their feet. These obviously can be set up anywhere. We talked about lots of ideas for on the way back on bars, uh, idle time stations, things you're doing to, to utilize the time of your rotation uh, more economically, more efficiently, those types of things are very easy to achieve. Okay, handstands against the wall. They do these back against the wall and belly against the wall. And also, and it's not on this DVD, we do what we call wrist support handstands. If anyone was at the master workshops, anybody? Last summer? Nobody? Okay, okay, good. Uh, we did them using panel mats, springboards, things of that nature. And it's trying to get the kids the support or the, or the assistance that they get is down at the lower half of their body. Instead of when they go against the wall, the assistance is on the upper part of their body, making it much easier to do a handstand. You can imagine a vault board. The kids would then would stand on the vault board towards the high part. Okay? They put their hands on the floor, they bend their wrists, and they butt their wrists up against the vault board or a pound mat, or a low bound scheme, or even for your intermediate kids or your lower level kids, even a spotting block. Just 
anything that they can get up against where their legs are free. Their, their legs are not against something. Okay? And that's going to create that more difficult situation, but still not having to hold it on their own so they can do handstands for longer periods of time. Not against the wall. Not against the wall. So it would just be that it would be out in the open. So their, their lower body their, their lower body would be the thing that they're having to try to fight <laughs> What's that called again? Handstand what? It's called wrist support handstands. Um, sometimes it becomes arm support handstands because they're doing a spotting block with kids that are a little bit younger. But, uh, can you guys visualize what I'm saying? The, the, just their, their lower body. So here's the box. Their lower body is pushed up against it and they're holding the hands. Spot it first, get them to get it. But we have kids that can, on a vault board or a, even a piece of four by four wood, you know, anything that they can use just a little bit Lock that in, and that you know, gives them the ability to hold something that's much closer to a realistic handstand than even the wall. Almost like the stepping bridge that they do the dance with Iron Man from Chris Brown, but without the legs. Very similar, except it would be the other direction. So you can go a little higher, like uh, to the shoulder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going wrists, forearms, elbows, even just getting to where their half their body is pushed up against that mat. And just so their legs are. Legs aren't locked into the wall. That makes it much easier. Yeah. And you're going to notice that your kid's going to be able to, you can hold a handstand against the wall for two minutes. They get out to one of those, and it ain't happening in two minutes. Okay, but as they build, you know, those those kids I had last year, Cammie could probably do a wrist support handstand against the ball board for four minutes. She's a strong little girl. Um, but that would obviously be built up over time. Okay, but it's an excellent way and an alternative way to train handstands with assistance for long period of time. Okay, but belly against the wall and back against the wall. And then the other thing I, I talk about a lot is when you're spotting your kids on handstands or, or when they're spotting each other, most of the time when I see people doing it, it's with the athlete's back towards the spotter. Okay, and that works. That's cool. But I think a better way is to go to the side of the gymnast and then to create kind of a little cylinder almost with your fingers and to get them to do it by themselves, somewhat bouncing off of that little imaginary cylinder, if that makes sense. They're not just holding them. They're not having to do anything. Okay, but backing off a little bit, again, using your fingertips, and if they, helping them find their center, and then if they, once they fall off that center a little bit, they peel your fingers and they try to make an adjustment. So they're trying to pull off of your hands and doing it that way. It's a much better way than just holding them. Even there, it's, there's kind of a varying degree of, of shoulder flexibility there. The gymnast with her belly against the wall is doing a really good job of pushing through, and then the gymnast with her back against the wall struggles a little bit with shoulder flexibility for pushing through kind of flexibility. So that may be a factor as well. All right, but moving on. There's a lot here. Yeah. Okay. We're trying to do these a lot. Okay, handstand holds. Very, very important. Shocked sometimes when I go into people's gyms and I say, you can see their handstands and the kids kick up the handstand and they can't do one. Okay. Handstand development is very important. Okay. This is a uh, handstand hold on the side, like I mentioned. I'm holding her pretty firmly there because there I'm actually pushing down on her. Okay. That's a handstand with resistance. I'm actually taking some of my weight and strength and I'm pushing down on her, trying to get her to buckle a little bit. So she's actually pushing against <laughs> That would be a handstand with resistance. Okay, hollow holds. These can be done with bent knees at first, of course. If you start with the hands low, then that would be a resistant hollow hold, where the partner would place their hand on the head, hand on the legs, and offer a little bit of friendly resistance. Okay, again, for the core leg lifts, with and without weights, we actually tested our kids last week. We let them max out at 40. We have, we have kids ranging anywhere from 10, which is pretty disappointing to be honest, all the way up to the 40, with most of the kids being able to do more than 25. Leg 
process of resistance, and this is obviously one of those exercises that we spoke of. It's very dynamic. Okay, this is going to start building some real power. It's literally a loop around their ankles. Uh, you have a partner that holds it, and they're actually trying to pull leg lifts up to the bar with that resistance on the surgery. Short leg lifts, and with the TOPS program, see these all the time. The leg lift is more in a controlled, controlled manner. Where they're only dropping down to hanging out position, trying to keep the head neutral, leg straight, toes pointed, ankles together, all that good stuff. And then we do a lot of just static holding in this position. So they would just hold it tight, they would hold it straddle, and a lot of times when they're holding it tight, we'll place a uh, medicine ball weight, some type of weights as they get stronger to be able to do it uh, with some resistance. Okay, conditioning of the side of the core, again, an area that I know that I wasn't doing enough of when we changed our conditioning program, but if, when you're having athletes doing pirouettes, when you're having athletes doing blind changes, <laughs> twisting, round offs, anything that has a sideward movement in it, side of their body better be strong or they're going to have difficulty doing those types of things. Weight shifting movements on bars, again, pure wetting, any type of turning, they're going to need to be very strong on their side as well. We call these swimmers. This is uh, for conditioning the back side of the body in a very simple manner. We incorporate these into our warm-up quite a bit. Okay, We don't just stretch during our warm-ups. We try to, we try to conditioning type exercises into their warm up. And this is excellent for uh, body tension on the back side of, of, the, of the body as well. This is just, we call this right arm, left leg up from their knees. It comes from mom's uh, yoga class. But they're, they're very good as far as getting kids very strong on the back side of the body also. We do variations where they bring their knee in and their elbow in that nature, try to get them to get in that position, kick their leg up a little bit, get the range of motion a little bit greater. Um, but, but doing lots and lots of this has really helped lower our incidence of back, of back injury issues with all the front tumbling that we know of in this country. Okay, plank exercises where they go out, out, in, in. Excellent for creating the shaping swinging on bars, for lengthening your tumbling, as I mentioned yesterday. Using ball boards. And again, you'll notice a lot of variety on the BBB, where we're just trying to create different environments, different settings for them to do the exercises. Because any time to keep things, in my opinion, fresh and exciting, the kids gravitate towards them more, they enjoy it more, and when they enjoy it, they're going to be more enthusiastic about it, and they try harder. This next one is a little more advanced variation where the wings are going to go out, out, and then they're going to try to pick up one arm and one leg. And these get a very difficult. You can see how hard she's having to work. Again, find those little muscles that stabilize those shapes. And it's, it's something that they have to kind of discover on their own. Spot it at first, then let them do it on their own as soon as possible. We showed these yesterday. Absolutely awesome drills for, for conditioning and shaping that, that, that hollow shape. We'll do it with their hands on the mat and then also with their feet on the side that is being pulled away. This, the mat that's against the wall, it's pretty important that it's against the wall because it's not going to stop. Okay. You don't even need to use mats. You can use furniture sliders we use quite a bit. The little white pipettes, they sell them in there. They're way too much money. You can go to Home Depot and get them. Okay. Those are fantastic for the same type of activity. And then also those ab wheels, we use those a lot. Okay, that's something the ab wheels are fantastic. They can actually do those exercises with their grips on. Okay, and that's something that we use in between turns on bars quite a bit. Okay, anything where you're starting to not just do the static core conditioning that's traditional, but starting to really add range of motion to those shaping exercises. You can see how far she's able to get out. That's really, really good stuff. 
uh, candle type exercises and using something that's got a little bit of a shape like that, whether it's a golf board or one of those mountain blocks. So they get up in that shape and they try to slowly lower as far as they can before they break the hip in. Trying to get rid of the pipe on this type of exercise. Uh, short stalder lifts. <coughs> Variation to the short leg lift that you can be straddled also. And then we do these as part of our conditioning program also with ankle weights. These also can be done in a full hanging position. All the leg lifts from a hang. We try to get the straddle as late as possible. Okay, just using a balance beam as a different variation. advanced for your upper level optional athletes. Again, just creating variety. You're not just doing the same old stuff every day. Okay, we call these windshield wipers. Basically a, a, a leg lift position that they're holding. They have to do that first, of course, then utilizing the side of the wheel boots. Windshield wipers. Using the edge of a panel mat with a partner, and that can be um, done on the end of a tumble track, can be done on a spotting block, whatever you've got, so that you can kind of get them right to the edge where they're able to go beyond what they can do on the floor. So we're trying to make the repetition a little bit more difficult. You'll notice varying arm positions. As we spoke of, the lower the arms, the easier the repetition is. So they will start with their arms up. As they start to feel fatigue, they will lower their arms to more of a middle or neutral arm position, and then as they get really tired, they'll lower their arms all the way to try to crank out a couple of more reps as they're getting tired. So the varying arm positions also hit different parts of the abdominal wall depending on where the arms are, and again, that variety, that mixing it up is very, very important. Low, medium, and high. Again, using that to the edge of, of, a, of a tumble track or whatever it is. Upper body strength, the things that I think that a lot of us would relate to bars conditioning type, type things on bars. Um, you're going to see uneven bars, parallel bars, boxes, all that stuff. Again, lots of variety. Just going through the motions that we use on uneven bars. Basic push up positions. Okay, again, static, very basic. As I showed yesterday in, in our bars lecture, is we do those on the knees at first, all the way into the beginning for the classes. Lifting up arms to the sides, to the front, to any angle that you can get kids doing it in. So really try to create that, again, stabilizing type conditioning exercise. So they're having to really lock in to not fall over. And that, those are uh, extremely important when it comes to pirouetting development and things of that nature. Try to keep the hips as square as possible when doing this. Okay, very, very basic push-up position there. We'll call these girl push-ups. I think if you do them with that quality, no one would argue that they're very valuable. Push-ups we do with elbows in, elbows slightly out like that, and then also with elbows all the way out. And hopefully you'll see all those variations. So that's kind of an in-between of elbows out and elbows in. I think that changing the arm angle that you do push-ups in is very important. Also changing the grip. Front grip, reverse grip, mixed grips, whatever you got. Right, using a BOSU ball or some type of uh, something that has a little bit of stability in it. I, I went over there yesterday. Did anybody go over and see that thing at Gary's where you've got that thing that wobbles back and forth? I bought one of those. <laughs> that thing's pretty awesome. Um, and again, I like those little toys that you can just stick somewhere where it doesn't need a whole lot of room. And you can use it as an on the way back type station. That the kids can for sure do with their grips on. Like finding little toys that they can do exercises without having to deep grip. Obviously that takes a whole lot of time. Okay, to get the hands up a little bit makes it a little bit easier for the kids. Getting their feet up a little bit makes it a little bit harder. So all of your push-ups and, and, and holds of, of that manner can be done with their feet up and also with their feet down. Okay. Push-ups 
push up to it in resistance. That is simply a piece of surgical tubing that goes over their back, it's crisscross, and then goes underneath their hands. This is, it's, it's sometimes, I think it's really something that has to be done on a bar. You try it on the floor, and it just tends to slip out. You always have to kind of lock it into the bar. But that's just a piece of surgical tubing or TheraBand, and it provides that resistance as they're getting stronger. You have that resistance, and they can uh, really challenge. You can also wrap it around the bar a lot of times, but um, it's typically they can just hold it kind of loose and they can their tongue off. Okay, kind of mixed grip push up, so one hand up and one hand down. It's definitely different parts of the, of the chest and the arms. And you're noticing the speed that she's doing these in, it's fairly slow. I'm trying to really make sure she's not. Arching her knees. If we're noticing that flat back throughout, not arching, not sticking the ribs out, not dropping the chest. Okay, push up with light or upper body plyometric type exercises. These are very basic ones. A little bit more advanced, so we're going from narrow to wide. Variation. We're going down and then up. And then the very advanced variation. Those are hard. You can see her struggling, that's a strong girl. Alright, moving into pull up type back exercises. Again, we talked yesterday a little bit about the crossfit pull ups where they bounce. Those are fantastic. Okay, our upper level kids do use them a lot. I think that that makes them a little more dynamic. It lets them do a lot more of them. They're really creating that muscle endurance that we need in gymnastics. I haven't had a whole lot of success of doing those with our little ones. They they look like spasms. Okay, so we try to slow things down and really do the exercises in a more controlled environment. Always at first with a spotter. Okay. Um, and we start pull-ups in the tuck position in the spotter. And like, hopefully this will show some of that. But you're just seeing the normal, regular old pull-ups. If you reverse your grip, we'll call those chin-ups. Okay, the, the quality that the kids are doing these in, that's the one with the knees tucked. And that's a very easy way to spot your kids as they're, as they're when they're young and they're just starting to do lots of reps with pull-ups. Okay, they pull ups in the L shape. You can also mix a lot of these exercises. We, we find that the kids really like that. Where they're doing, you know, three short leg lifts, don't drop your leg, and then do three pull ups in that tight position. But you can also spot all of that stuff because when, when the legs are there, it kind of gives you a handle at the spot. So it's, it's pretty easy to get them to really do the quality repetitions in a, in a manner where you're able to kind of control their form and, and, and that way. Leg lift pull-ups. I'm not really holding her legs very much. I'm just trying to keep them up there a little bit. That can also be done by themselves. Pull-ups behind the head. And again, just low repetitions at first. And you're doing the highest level of quality. Also, we talk about our kids when they're doing their conditioning. It's, it's, it's using max effort. Okay, if they're just going through the motions, Especially when it comes to legs, they're not getting stronger. They may be maintaining, but unless they're using max effort, they're probably not getting better. Okay, reverse grip or chin ups, same type of, of exercises. These also can be done with an ankle weight or a medicine ball on the legs when they get really strong. Constantly trying to push the envelope, trying to get them kind of really challenged in their. These kids were level sevens, maybe level eights. And Sarah might have been a level nine. Kind of 
variety pull-ups, we call these. It's just going through all the different grips. Pull-ups with ankle weights. Switching the grips. Switching grips in a hanging position is really good for pirouette development, like line change development. They have to shift their weight. So they have to get very strong, kind of holding on to the bar one hand at a time. And this is a set of, of three pull-ups followed by three chin-ups. Followed by three with the left hand turn. Followed by three with the right hand turn. If you do it with that level of quality, you're going to be a good spotter. That's a set. And they're going to do it. T bar dips. With and without weights. About 10 pounds of weight on a dowel. Normally, we would put the weight on. First, and then remove it as the kids are getting better. Using the weights first and then removing it as they get fatigued and then trying a couple more repetitions. Handstand push ups using the parallettes or parallel bars. Um, they really are great because they don't hurt the kids' wrists as much. Okay? You can use a T bar as a balance beam, little four parallettes, anything that you can do besides the flat wrist handstand push ups. That tends to really hurt their wrists. Noticing the back of her body, not arching, ribs are not poking out. We would do these with legs bent at first also to try to create, making it a little bit easier for the kids to keep the core engaged. When they bend their legs, it's easier to stay hollow. Okay? It's easier to stay straight. When they, when they straighten their legs, you're going to start to see the ribs poking out a little bit more, a little bit more arch. You notice that we're doing handstand push-ups here in multiple <coughs> different grips. Regular grip, that's reverse grip. And then kind of just a mixed grip a little bit. Yep. Handstand push ups, a mixed grip, very good for pirouetting. And then only sets that they can perform. Those shoulder leans that we showed yesterday in the bars lecture, we're using panel mats this time. Turning the hands sideways so that they don't hurt their wrists. But leaning those shoulders out into that planchy type position is very, very strenuous on the shoulders. She's feeling that. Okay, and that's an excellent drill if you're having trouble developing press handstands with your kids. Usually it's because they're not strong enough as their shoulders get in front of them. Showing some press handstands. This is obviously using the wall. We use the wall, we use spotters, and they use boxes, they use whatever they can. But the, again, like we spoke of with the wrist support handstands, the lower the object is as they get better at it, the more difficult it becomes. So the wall would be the easiest because they can put their entire back up against it. As they get a little bit stronger, as lowering that surface makes it a little bit to get your kids when they spot each other to not give, give themselves a break. Not, the idea is not that you're making the, the job easier for the gymnast that's doing it. Okay, you're, just, you're assisting them because you're trying to make it difficult. Just all the presses. Not all of our kids can do that. Might be lying. Um, but we try to get them to do that as early on as possible a lot of spotting drills. We're using the bungee cords, for upper body conditioning, calf handstand pulls, noticing that the legs are bent. When the legs are bent, it makes it easier to maintain that core dynamic, keeping the back flat against the wall. When we do bungee conditioning, we do a lot of this stuff with partners. And we spoke about it yesterday. I love partner style stuff. I think it's great for team building. I think it's great for taking ownership, almost becoming little mini coaches. And they coach each other, and they straighten their legs, you know, da da da, and it, it really works out very well. We also use that in our programs just as far as our gymnastics is concerned. I like it when the kids interact with one another. When the two kids are learning the same skill, I make them watch each other. I make them coach each other on the mistakes that they make. That really works well with conditioning also. And 
more that they know about the sport. They're not just little robots going through the motions. The more that they know, the better they are going to be because their understanding becomes better. And then down the road, you have a really wonderful employee base. different exercises. We don't have to use our balance beam. It can be done on the floor. It can be done on a panel mat, a box, whatever. And again, doing it where they would do 30 reps and then switch. Or they would find a different exercise. And just doing things of that nature. The other thing that we use quite a bit to make conditioning interesting is circuit style conditioning. Uh, we do a bar circuit or upper body conditioning circuit two days a week. It takes about 30 minutes to do it. It's about 12 13 different stations where they're on those stations for two minutes and then they rotate. They give them a 30 second rota rotate break basically so they can go to the next station, get ready. All of that stuff is done with a partner. They're not doing leg lifts for two minutes straight, but they're maybe doing uh, 20 leg lifts and then switching partners and things of that nature. <coughs> but, but partnering up, I think, is, is a great way to get a lot done. Okay, I'm going to move on to leg strength. Nine minutes, you guys ready? Okay, this is kind of a complete dissection of the legs, starting with ankles all the way up through the, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes. Okay, um, just some ideas of what you can be doing as far as rehab is concerned. We all know what rehab is. These are things that are trying to prevent injuries or when injuries occur, the, their ability to recover faster uh, is greatly improved by doing these ankle therapy type exercises before they perhaps injure their ankle. Okay, that's just a piece of TheraBand. You can buy this stuff in bulk by the box. We make those little shackles or loops and the kids either have their own, which they keep in their locker, or you've got them hanging on little Home Depot hooks all around the gym so they can simply grab one and do something to keep themselves busy instead of moving around. The biggest area of concern is the vault line, in my opinion. Do a ball, so let it go back and get in line or chatting or talking about everything except for what you just told them on how to make their neck fall better. So creating little stations on the way back is a very good thing. Bosu ball for ankle stabilization, those are excellent. They are a little bit expensive for what they are. Um, there's, there's other ways to do it. There's the next thing you're going to see is called an ankle arch plus. You can get those online, uh, very inexpensive way to do these types of exercises, which you can see during these, how much they're actually working to keep that balance. Okay, that's called an ankle arch plus. It was developed by an orthopedic surgeon, and it's something that the kids use. And watch, watch how she goes here. Pretty still, and then she starts to fatigue, you're going to really see that thing move. Okay, so she's getting tired now, those little ligaments and, and muscles in her ankles are starting to get tired. You're going to see a lot of movement there. So those, any type of, of tools that you can use there are awesome. Um, <coughs> that obviously can be done very simply on the way back to your ball. Another one is called a bob, the black, like angle looking thing. And they can do uh, like <coughs> toe raises, things of this nature on that. And it gives them a full range of motion, POV. Things you can find those online. You look up like trainers or something like that to find them. Uh, but simple toe raises, one foot at a time, two feet, different variations as far as putting your feet up on a panel mat or a balance beam to achieve a full range of motion. But I believe that these things need to be done in hundreds. They need to be done every day. Okay? Calf development is something that people ask us, you know, why we feel like our kids are such good vaulters. Why, we, why they get up off the floor so well and they're tumbling at our upper levels, a lot of it has to do with calf development. If the kids have little chicken calves, they're probably not going to tumble real strong. Okay? We're trying to get the calves built so they can create that power. Not in sets of 10, not in sets of 15, sets of 100, sets of 150. Okay? This would be toe raises with resistance. The gymnast is simply hands on the shoulders, applying downward pressure, and giving her a little bit to think about on her calf raises. Instead of making her lift a lot harder. Of course, they can just apply 
leg pressure. And they can really start pushing down. We actually have kids get up on a box. They can really push down on the shoulders. We do it piggyback. Probably not going to work with your level ones. They'll be cracking up at this point. This is the most fun thing they ever did. Um, but as they get a little bit older, these kids aren't very old at that time, 9 or 10 years old. Piggyback toe raises and then piggyback rubber leg walks. They're very, very good for calf strength development. Use a part of your ball to warm up the ball complex. And again, because they're buddied up, they're partnered up, they have a lot of fun. The calf raise is using a uh, TheraBand. We've done on the low beam, we put them on the uh, panel head, put it under a little box. The bigger the object underneath them, they're obviously going to have to have a longer floor. So the low floor down. the other. Just doing calf raises with resistance. That's a fairly simple level of resistance. We also go up to our purple and black uh, surgical tubes for those types of exercises also. Those are the punches or, or relevé jumps. Those are excellent as far as getting that dynamic type of exercise done. Uh, it's done a little bit more slowly. These are called hamstring curls. Up again, creating that resistance, <coughs> having to work like that. You can tell. And then our hamstring push ups. <coughs> Actually, these are just simple leans where the feet are stabilized. And they just lean out. Again, you can kind of see how much the back of the legs are having. A lot of times in gymnastics, one of the mistakes we also make is our kids' quads are very, very strong. The hamstrings are not. Okay, so it's important that those are obviously a strong part of the body as well. Hamstring push-ups. Trying to keep the hips flat or without segmentation. You can use the arms as little as possible, making the, the motion come through the hamstrings. But she's doing those very dynamically. It can also be done very slowly in the Simple exercise, just little wall sits. Okay, very good for the quads and the hamstrings. People ask me a lot, like when I'm doing bar lectures, our kids take forever to put their grips on. Have them put their grips on in one of those. Be very quick grip putter on us. Okay, simple straight jumps. Okay, standing still. Add the motion, good angle, always looking for max effort. Okay, if you have kids do 40 straight jumps and they're not trying very hard, the largest muscle groups in the body are not going to get stronger. Okay, straight jumps with, with forward momentum or horizontal momentum, using the arm swing, working on the technique that you're going to want to use for your landings. Lunge walks, we do these with and without resistance. I spoke of yesterday, but we also recently created was PVC pipes. Uh, we have 10 of them in our gym that are filled with sand. They weigh about 10 pounds, and we have 10 of them that are filled with gravel. They weigh about 15 pounds, and it's simply just a PVC pipe with caps glued to the end, fill them, cap the other end, and they're like sticks. They work phenomenally for this type of activity. They're excellent for bar position. <laughs> Start to add a little bit of resistance. Dumbbells, and then those on the back of the screen are plate weights. Plate weights are a little bit more dangerous. I definitely don't recommend them if you've got kids that are not focused and disciplined. Drop one of those on your foot. You're going to have a real rough day. And all of our leg exercises we do forwards and backwards. As they get better at them and we start showing more quality, they would then add a little bit more speed to these things. Okay, so start doing lunge walks a little faster as they get better. Um, we've got a joke here. You know, see me, I love it. Call these skiers, um, movements that are lateral, okay, not just forward and backwards, but sideways. We look, uh, I got 
got a lot of this stuff from our physical therapist that works with our athletes. Lateral movements is very, very important, especially with female athletes because of the new, we really in the last 15 years of the prevalence of ACL tears. So the sideways type exercises are very important. And there's you see one of our college kids with a knee brace on because she tore ACL. Okay, the skiers using the ball, skiers will use, will use panel mats, boxes, whatever. This is with a little bit of resistance. These are the soft medicine balls that I spoke of a little bit earlier. I think they're filled with sand, but they're very soft and pliable. So if the kids were to drop those on their foot, no problem. Okay, we have them ranging from six to 12 pounds. And again, max effort when they're doing their leg motion. <laughs> walks, yeah. just big step sideways trying to create a straight line between the legs with about a six pound weight, and they do these both directions but facing the same way each other, so if they're leading with the opposite leg as they do the repetitions. Mountain climbers, these can be done with and without ankle weights, we do a lot of these post floor routine, so they get done with their floor routine. They have to run over to those boxes and do another 100 leg lifts right after it. As we're doing that, and they add speed, they add dynamics, their cardiovascular strength gets better very, very rapidly. That would be with the ankle weights. Again, seeing a lot of exercises, again, we call it static, then with a little bit of speed or slow motion, and then very dynamic or holistic type exercises as they get better. Never compromising quality for the number that they're doing or the speed that they're doing them in. Okay, hip flexor type strengthening. With and without weights, they do these in splits and then also in straddle. Excellent for developing the strength that they need for, for jumps and leaps. Um, back side of the body or hamstring conditioning, glute conditioning, done with straight legs and also bent legs. As they're younger, Resistance, so the hands are on the hips. She's having to push up with the athlete's or spotter's body weight on top. Very good exercise for glutes and hamstrings. Same kind of thing with body straight. And varying arm positions, the lower the arms, the easier it will be. Go ahead, go ahead a little faster here so we can show you the flyout. Show those. Same kind of thing, but with one leg up. And they would do that at 45 degrees and then facing the ceiling, the leg all the way up. And then they can do those with, with resistance as well. Box pushes, no big deal. And then the flyout. I want to go through. Okay, box pushes with weights. As they get tired, we remove the weight and we do a couple more. Other thing is, um, our level kids just get a little level three or level four on the box. Let them push the little guys around. The little guys think it's the best thing ever. The big guys, not so much. All right, and the last thing we'll show is, is our summer plyometric exercises. These are eight panel mats spaced four feet apart. Okay, we do tops, which is when they jump on the top of the box, then the bottom, then the top, then the bottom. Then we do what we call just bottoms, which is where they would go over the top and just hit the little valley. Okay, um, the, the set basically that we do is two foot top, all the way down to the eight mats, then two foot uh, our right foot tops, then left foot tops. Okay, and they're always not sprinting back, but running back in a nice hustling manner, not walking, not catching their breath. Okay, so this would be the right leg top. Really trying to work the posture, being very careful of their foot placement. This is the one I mentioned. We've had kids sprain ankles. We've had kid, a kid break an ankle. And just like about a month ago, we had a kid trip over the front and she broke her arm. So that's something you have to be very careful of. Make sure it's very supervised activity. 
And if the kids are small or younger, they're not strong enough, they're poking their ribs out, they're making those shapes that we don't want to see, try to find something else to do until they're strong. So we do this twice a week in the summer, and then as they start getting into school and we start getting closer to season, I back off on this stuff because of the risk factor. And we go to other types of biometric exercises for those. Body body deodorant. Deodorant makes no difference. Okay. Um, yeah, it really doesn't matter. But the entire sequence of the six things we call that one. Okay, so it's two leg top, right leg top, left leg top. Two leg bottom, right leg bottom, left leg bottom, that's one. Okay. Over on the one leg too, because those guys will be able to bring that. That's starting to get where they're, they're really getting stronger. Although these two guys are probably about 10 at the time. Okay, and they're able to do it pretty controlled as they get better. Really, again, make sure that you're doing that systematically, methodically, not, not doing it too quickly. And then I guess we'll just show this. This is the stuff we do during the season for biometrics. Okay, they're not having to jump over anything. They're not going to trip on an edge. So that we call these down and outs. They simply jump down, and then they jump out three, four, five times as far as they can with and without weights. Okay, and those are excellent for developing the power. All right. Thanks, guys.